Hi, my name is Lexa Scuppum. I am a molecular biologist with the Virology Laboratory for the Center for Veterinary Biologics. Today I'm going to be talking about um, real-time PCR and doing a demonstration of how to set one up as well as how to do the data analysis. First, I wanted to introduce you to some of the equipment that we recommend you use. Um, first of all, this is a biosafety cabinet, and we also have in this room a clean hood. The biosafety cabinet is designed specifically to protect the user and the work from one another. So the air circulates inside the biosafety cabinet, pulling air in past the user that goes into this grate that is then circulated through a HEPA filter before it comes back down into the workspace. And you can see how the, the airflow is pulled onto that grate. So this is the uh, setup that we generally recommend that you use. I'm going to be doing the real-time PCR setup just on a bench top. I've been doing PCR and real-time PCR for 25 years and I can get away with doing that. Um, but we don't recommend that most people do it. It will also make filming easier for us. Uh, so we will move out to my bench where we will film putting together the reaction. So I want to show you some of the equipment that we'll be using today. First, the primary pieces of equipment are the pipetters. And we have pipetters that range from uh, one mil volumes down to one microliter volumes. And they use um, different size tips depending on the volume that you are interested in dispensing. We use tips that are DNA and RNA free and that also have a filter in them. So that reduces any splashing up onto the pipette itself and protects reactions from getting contaminated that way. Other pieces of equipment that we will use are 1.5 mil tubes. These are the 1.5 mil tubes that we do most of our work in. They have a hinged lid that snaps shut and is then watertight. Um, there are correct and incorrect ways to open these tubes. One of the correct ways is with both hands and being careful to not touch the inside of the tube. Another correct way is if the tube is in a rack, you can open it without touching the inside of the tube. A third method is with a tube opener, which very handily helps you not touch the inside of the tube. The way that you should not open one of these tubes is one-handed. It's very tempting to hold the tube like this and to open it with your thumb, but when you do, often enough, your thumb is going to hit the underside of the lid. And when that happens, then you have the DNA or whatever was in the tube on your thumb. And as you go to close the tube, as you touch other things, then an opening another tube, then you have transferred what was on your thumb to that cap and contaminated whatever you're working with. Next, I wanna talk about some of the specialized real-time PCR equipment that we're going to use. Um, the reactions are set up in 96 well plates that hold about 100 microliters each. And it's helpful to have a rack to put them in the plates are labeled A through H and 1 through 12. After your reaction is in them, you can seal them a couple of different ways. 
You can seal them with either optical caps, like these, or optical tape, like this. Uh, the optical caps will snap down and create a very nice seal. The optical tapes, you want to make sure when you're adding the optical tape on that you do not touch it with your bare fingers. That's true for the optical caps as well. Um, so I will generally use that to press it down. And then particularly go around the edges to try to get those pressed down. Um, but you can see that sometimes the seal on the edge is not so good. So if I have to use an optical tape, I often will not use the wells that are on the edge. So I'm confined to the wells in the center. Um, for that reason, I prefer the optical caps. Um, we also have a small centrifuge. Uh, it holds six 1.5 mil tubes, and it's just, it, it doesn't go very fast, but it is good for getting droplets from the inside of a tube uh, collected down into the bottom of a tube, and so we use this a lot. We also have a vortexer, which allows you to mix a sample easily. After you've mixed it, you'll then want to put it in the microfuge and spin the liquid back down. We have racks that will specifically hold the 1.5 mil tubes, and we have racks that will specifically hold the microtiter plates. So that's it for the equipment and next we will start getting ready to set up the reactions. Before you start a reaction, it's important to have the paperwork ready to make sure that you have performed all of the steps. This is an example of the paperwork that we use. Um, it includes the date and who's done the work, what the run actually is. So this is the Tomlinson Equine Parvovirus TACMAN PCR. We're using the Invitrogen Superscript Platinum QPCR Supermix UDG. Um, and that is the master mix that we will be using. In this section, it describes the setup of the reaction. So we have water for a single reaction that would be 2.6 microliters of water, 10 microliters of the master mix UDG, 0.8 microliters of the forward primer and the reverse primer and the probe. The primers and probes are all at 10 micromolar. And up here, we can put in how many samples we want to run. So in this case, I'm saying 39 samples this worksheet in its electronic format will automatically calculate this plus one times this to give this volume of 101.4 microliters. So to set up enough reaction mix for this entire experiment, we'll use 101.4 microliters of water, 390 microliters of master mix, and 31.2 microliters of each primer and probe. The primers and the probe are described below um, the sequence and how long the amplicon is to be expected. The lot numbers for the primers and probe are also in the table above. The thermocycler that we're going to use, uh, it's ID number is here, and when we start the reaction, we'll put down what time we started it. 
The conditions for the thermal cycling are in this part of the table. Initially, we will heat the sample to 95 degrees for five minutes, and that will disassociate the double-stranded DNA. In stage two, there, is a 40, there are 45 cycles of 95 degrees for 30 seconds, followed by 58 degrees for one minute. The optical reading occurs in this step. This is the, the annealing and elongation step. So as the temperature changes from 95 degrees to 58 degrees, the primers will sit down on the single-stranded DNA. The polymerase will then start to extend that uh, single-stranded into double-stranded DNA for about a minute and the thermocycler will take a picture of the fluorescence during this cycle. This part of the page down here is reminiscent of a microtiter plate, so A through H, 1 through 12, A through H, 1 through 12, and you can see that all of our samples are going to be performed in triplicate. So the, we have unknowns, samples number one through five, and they will go into A4, A5, A6, and on down. Columns one, two, and three are reserved for our standards. We make a standard curve by doing a dilution series of a plasmid with known quantities. So we have a plasmid that is 10 to the 5 copies per reaction, a plasmid that is 10 to the 4 copies, 3, 2, 1, and then we will also include a water negative control. Okay, so this is the part where we set up our reactions. The first thing to do is to glove up and then to wipe down your work area. You're gonna use bleach, a 10% mixture that is made fresh at least weekly. By the end of a week, the bleach will have degraded. So I tend to make it up every Monday morning. Um, you want to wipe down your pipettes particularly the barrels. And your tip boxes. After you've used the 10% bleach, you need to do a wipe down with 70% ethanol to remove the bleach from your surfaces. Okay, so the first step for doing a real-time PCR is doing a dilution series on the plasmid positive control. The reaction that we're doing today is for equine parvovirus, and the plasmid that I'm working with is an equine parvovirus 3 plasmid that contains the target site on it in a single copy. And I have in this tube a concentration of 1 times 10 to the 6 copies of that plasmid per microliter. So that means targets per microliter. And we can use this in a dilution series then to calculate what our quantification, starting quantification is for our unknowns. Keep everything on ice. The diluent that I'm going to be using today is one nanogram per microliter of salmon sperm DNA. Having the extra DNA in the reaction with the plasmid helps us to get a nice straight standard curve. And while it's tempting to make your dilutions in the smallest possible volume, I recommend against that. I will generally do 10 microliters of DNA into 90 microliters of water or five microliters of DNA into 45 microliters of water or diluent in this case, the salmon sperm DNA. So 
So I'm gonna put 45 microliters of salmon sperm DNA into each of the dilution tubes, and we're gonna dilute from 10 to the five copies per microliter down to 10 to the zero copies per microliter. And I will label my tubes as I have dispensed the DNA into them, but not before that, so that if I get disturbed partway through my procedure, then I know where I left off when I can get back to it. Okay. Five microliters of one times 10 to the six copies of the plasmid into 45 microliters of the diluent. And when I put it in, I plunge up and down a few times to rinse the tip. And I make sure that there's no liquid remaining in the tip afterwards. So this will be the 10 to the 5 dilution. And I don't know what the magic amount of time is for vortexing to make sure that you have an even suspension, but I tend to vortex for an entire minute. When I do this, I end up with nice curves it might not be necessary to vortex for an entire minute, but I have not run the range of times to test, and so this is what I stick with. It's a very good idea to spin every tube before you open it when you're doing real-time PCR, particularly if the sample has been in the refrigerator or the freezer and may have gotten some condensation on the lid or if you have just vortexed it and you may have gotten some condensation around the lid. Um, opening a tube that has condensation around the lid is a very good way to get cross-contamination in your reactions. So I make a habit of centrifuging a tube every time before I open it. And then you want to balance the microfuge so that your, uh, your centrifuge head doesn't get off kilter. Um, it's not such a big deal in these, but it is a very big deal in the big centrifuges. So 10 to the five is ready. Five microliters of 10 to the five into 45 microliters of 10 to the four. Again, I'm rinsing the tip, checking to make sure there's no liquid and vortexing for a minute. 10 to the four. Since I vortexed it, now I need to microfuse it. Okay, five microliters of 10 to the four into 45 microliters of diluent. And vortex. 10 to the three. Five microliters into 45 microliters of diluent. For 10 to the two. 10 to the two. Five microliters. Ten to the one. Okay, tenfold dilution series of ten to the five copies of your target gene per microliter down to ten to the zero copies of target gene per microliter. A tool here that I use sometimes for vortexing. It is meant as a um, tube floater for when you're boiling samples, but I found that if I turn it upside down, if I need to vortex a lot of samples simultaneously, I can put 
the tubes in upside down, and then vortex on this point. And that's a nice way to not cramp your hand. At this point, it's a very good idea to turn on your real-time thermocycler. The camera needs time to warm up in it, and it's just better to not have your reaction in there while you're doing that. So at this point, you can put your dilution series on ice. while you're making your master mix. So today we're using the Platinum QPCR Supermix UDG, and the UDG platform incorporates uracils instead of thymidines into the PCR amplicons. If your uh, reaction requires handling of the amplicons post-amplification, there's a possibility for contaminating your workspace with that uracil containing nucleic acid. The UDG master mix includes not just the uracils, but also an enzyme that will degrade DNA, RNA, that has the uracil in it during the 95 minute denaturation cycle at the very beginning before your, your uh, second experiment. Therefore, any potentially contaminating template that was generated from your first reaction cannot cause problems with your second reaction. So we just have five components of this master mix, the UDG, water, forward primer, reverse primer, and probe. So I will add those components in as calculated by the worksheet. We have DNA RNAs free water that we purchase and aliquot into small tubes to make sure that every time we use water, it is, um, it is nucleus free as well as DNA and RNA free. So you shouldn't get any contamination from your water. Okay the UDG Supermix. Okay, one thing that I would like to point out here is that some liquids you'll be pipetting are more viscous than others and act differently by capillary action inside your uh, your pipette tips. And so I wanted to show you, uh, we have some dye here that has glycerol in it, so it should be easy to see. When you're sucking up something that has glycerol in it, you want to put your pipette tip just past the surface, draw it up, and as you can see as I'm drawing it up, the liquid is wicking down the side of the tube. You can also get droplets on the end of your pipette. When you dispense the liquid then, you're going to get wicking on the outside again. So this time I've pushed my thumb down to the first stop, but we still have this much liquid in the pipette. So then a gentle, slow push down to the second stop then gets everything out of the tip. The super mix is going to have glycerol in it and so it's going to act like that. I'm using different pipettes and different sized pipette tips for the different kinds of volumes. So this is a much smaller volume, therefore a smaller pipette. the forward primer. Be careful not to touch the inside of the lid. Our primers we also store aliquoted into small volumes. Um, 
We have some tubes that are aliquoted at 10x concentration, and so you need to check your label to make sure that you're at the right concentration before you dispense. And finally, the probe. The probe we aliquot, we, we aliquot into 50 microliter volumes. We also do a dilution down to the required concentration as our very first step after we've received the primer from the, uh, the manufacturer. We then dispense into very small tubes which we can then break apart and we only freeze thaw this the one time. So we receive it from the manufacturer, we add buffer to get it to the correct concentration for our reactions, dispense it into small volumes and then freeze it. And then when we use it, since it's already been freeze thawed once, we'll throw it away. Another thing to know about the probe is that it is light sensitive. So when you pull it out of the freezer to thaw it, it's a good idea to wrap it in foil while you're letting it thaw. Also, while you're setting up your reaction, you want to protect it from light. That does not mean that you need to do your reactions in the dark. Um, some people think you do, and it's very hard to pipette correctly in the dark. Um, it just means to not dilly-dally, while you're setting up your reactions. I don't like to vortex my master mix. I don't think that vortexing is good for enzymes. So I will invert the tube a few times and then give it a spin to get any liquid off of the lid. And at this point, we're ready to dispense the master mix into the PCR plate. Our total reaction volume for this reaction is 20 microliters. So 15 microliters of that is the master mix and five microliters of that will be our template. When you're dispensing the master mix, it is not critical to get a perfect amount, a perfect 15 microliters into each well. The camera on the, uh, on the thermal cycler will take an initial fluorescence reading and subtract all of that out from the background. Um, subtract all of that background out. The important pipetting is when you add your five microliters of template to your reactions. When you're doing that, you want to be very, very precise and careful. So 15 microliters of master mix per well. This master mix is going to be a little bit sticky, kind of like the super mix was because of the glycerol. I will generally get the tip wet by measuring up and down a few times. And then I just dispense into the wells to the first stop. You might get a little bit of liquid, but you don't get a buildup and you don't get a lot of wicking. So it's not critical at this point to make sure that every tiny little droplet is off of your tip. It is, however, important that if you put your wetted tip into the reaction mix and you see a bubble on the end of the tip, just pull the tip out and put it back in and that bubble will probably be gone. Okay, so the master mix is dispensed 
and the tube can go into the trash. At this point, I'm going to move to my smallest pipetter. It's a P10, meaning that its maximum volume is 10 microliters. We're going to be dispensing five microliters of our template into each of these wells. Okay, and I'm going to set my templates out in order. I'm right-handed, so I generally like to work right to left when I'm loading the plate. And as I'm doing that, then I will cover over the wells that I have added template to, to protect them. I will also often, if I'm gonna be loading an entire plate, I feel like I don't want the, uh, the probe floor for to be exposed to light very much. So I can also cover up parts of the plate that I don't want to have exposed to light while I'm working on other parts of the plate. For my unknowns, I don't know which ones are going to have a strong signal and which ones are going to have no signal. So the order in which I add them to the plate doesn't necessarily matter. I do know, however, that my 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4 concentrations of my uh, dilution series have high enough copy number that I could easily cross-contaminate into my unknowns. So at this point, I'm going to load my unknowns first, and then after those are loaded, I'm going to put the lids on. One thing that you may also want to do, depending on how you're loading your wells, which direction you're loading your wells, and how you plan to seal your plate. If you've filled up a row with template, you can either cover it with foil, or you can rip off a strip of cellophane tape and just put that over the top so that you feel more comfortable that you haven't cross-contaminated your sample. Okay, so five microliters. You can see on the tip there are marks where the volumes are. And so I'm going to very carefully put the tip just past the surface of the, uh, the DNA sample before I draw it up. And then dispensing. And I do at this point, after I've dispensed, I can see a tiny bit of liquid on the end. I want that in the reaction. So I will touch the side of the tube of the well with the tip and plunge down to the second stop to get that last bit of liquid out of the tip. I also don't use the same tip for replicates. You'll see a new tip every time I go into my sample. That's for a number of reasons. First of all, every time you use the tip, you increase the chance of accumulating liquid that could be transferred to the next, the next sample and skew your copy number readings. Um, also, if you have touched something with your tip, while you're dispensing, then if you take that same tip and put it back into your sample, then you have contaminated that sample. And this is really a precious sample. So you don't want to do that. So new tip every time you go into your unknowns.
The unknown templates are dispensed into the wells, and now I'm going to put caps on. And I don't want to get the caps contaminated. They're hard to get out of the bag without contaminating, without touching them. And so I tend to use tweezers to pull them out of the bag. And I put the caps on the row closest to me first so that my hands aren't hanging over the reactions while I'm putting the lids on. For these optical caps, it's okay to touch the lids to push them down if your hands are gloved. But if you um, are not wearing gloves, then the oils from your skin can get on that surface and cause problems with the fluorescence readings during thermal cycling. So I'm going to move on to adding the <clears throat> templates for our standard curves. I'm going to switch my foil so that my unknown samples are covered, protected from light. And I'm going to start at the lowest concentration. In this particular case, that is my water no template control. All of these I'm performing in triplicate. Okay, five microliters of 10 to the zero copies per microliter means I'm going to be adding roughly five copies of my target per reaction. There is some stochasticity associated with pipetting. And so the likelihood that you're going to get five and not four or six is not always a reasonable expectation. Okay, 10 to the 1, 5 microliters, 50 copies per reaction. The more concentrated you get, the easier it is to have your data points being close together because the difference between 48 or 49 and 50 is not as great as the difference between four and five. Okay. Okay, and now we're ready to put the reactions into the thermocycler. When you want to spin down a plate, you need to make sure that the, uh, the bottoms of the tubes are facing out. So in this case, the tubes are slanted to the outside as it spins. And in this piece of equipment here, uh, this is the balance plate. The, uh, the bottoms of the tubes are facing me, the top of the plate away. So I'm going to place it in the spinner this direction. Just give it a quick spin. That does a couple of things. It collects all the liquid to the bottom, but if there happen to be bubbles in the very bottom, they would act um, as insulators. And so when you're thermal cycling the plate, the liquid that was in a tube that had a bubble at the bottom wouldn't actually get the thermal cycling. So the spinning pulls the liquids down, forces the bubbles up to the top where they don't create a problem. We use a BioRad CFX96. There are a lot of different kinds of 
real-time thermocyclers that you can use. This is the one that we have. And this is where you set the plate. This is a heated lid that moves up and down. Part of, part of that sound was the machine adjusting how far away from the lid that, that plate was. Um, all of the uh, fluorescence and camera equipment is in the top and there are, um, there's a camera inside that will take pictures of the plate as it's cycling. Okay, so I'm going to go to saved files because this is a protocol that we use quite a bit. So 95 degrees for five minutes, followed by 30 seconds at 95 degrees, one minute at 58 degrees, and then it cycles back. So 45 cycles of 95 and 58 with a plate read um, at the end of the 58 degree cycles. Press run. And the reactions are 20 microliters. If your volume was different, you could change that. The lid temperature you always want to have at about 105 degrees, so that's perfect. If you, you have choices here for what colors you want the cameras to detect. We have a FAM fluorophore on our probe, and so we can just choose the cyber FAM setting. OK, and the run is starting. <laughs> OK. So the lid is preheating up to 105 degrees. Once it gets there, then the machine will start to heat the plate up to 95 degrees for its initial five minute uh, denaturation. While this is happening, you can look at the graph. Right now there's nothing, but as the cycles progress, the fluorescence that is detected by the cameras will be recorded here and you can actually see the curves develop over time. So here's our raw unprocessed data and we have four different views of the same data so that we can refer to different pieces of the information that we need quickly. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do is go into View Edit Plate. This is the plate and change the setup to mirror what we actually did. So I'm just going to quickly, all, all of these unknown, and label them with FAM and then these A through F were our standards. We have three reps for each so replicate series there are three reps starting at replicate one the reps are horizontal, and so apply. So now you can see our dilution series in three reps, and we're going to label these with the number of copies that we put into each well. So go to dilution series, 
our first well had five times 10 to the fifth copies of the target plasmid in each well. So the plasmid that we used was one times 10 to the five copies per microliter. We put five microliters of that into our reaction. Therefore, our starting concentration for these wells is five times 10 to the five. Um, this number has a dilution factor of 10. It's decreasing. And so if we apply, then five times 10 to the five, four, three, two, one, zero appears. And that is correct for our standard control, our standard curve. Uh, G one through three was our no template control. And then we had five, five unknowns that, let's see, also had replicates. So we're applying those, okay. And all of these wells were empty. So we're going to remove those from the analysis. Unknown one through five. I like to recolor these so the data is easy to see when we go back to look at the curves. So I go to trace styles and change the colors in a way that is easy for me to remember. Apply those changes. So standard number one was five times 10 to the five copies per reaction. And those red curves are all on top of one another. And in the standard curve chart on the top right, um, the standards are shown as circles and the unknowns are shown as X's. The circles are right on top of one another for five times 10 to the five copies. As we go down, there's gonna be a little bit of spread between the reps and that is okay we want that spread to not be greater than 0.3 CT. So this standard, this is five copies per reaction. This is a hard one to hit. And over on the bottom right, the CTs for these reps are 37.3, 36.3, 35.3, we would prefer that those CTs be within 0.3 of one another, but they are not greater than 3.3. Uh, A CT difference of 3.3 is one log. And considering that this is the five copies, having a CT one apart from one another is just fine. Here at 50 copies, we did a better job in getting the, the reps right on top of each other. For our unknowns, those reps are also right on top of one another, 23.1, 23, 23. So that is quite good. The data automatically figures out what your starting copy number is for your unknowns by referring back to the data that you gave it for your standards. So if standard two, five times 10 to the four copies is similar to unknown one, standard two, the CTs are about 22.6 and the unknowns are calculated 
according to the knowns. So this, this uh, unknown has 4.4 times 10 to the 4 copies that it started with. The number of copies that it ended with can be seen up here as relative fluorescence units. So this graph, this is the number of cycles. So we ran 45 cycles of the reaction. So this is from time zero up until an hour and a half later. Relative fluorescence units just shows the difference in the amount of light given off by each well. And so if it is a perfect doubling of your PCR product, then you're not going to get any signal for quite a while, but then you're going to get this uh, logarithmic curve. And what you're looking for is this inflection point right here, where this curve crosses this is the threshold that determines what the CT is. The threshold can be dragged up and down, and that will change what the CTs are. So establishing a limit of detection based on CT is dangerous because you can change your CT simply by raising and lowering this threshold. What you're looking for, though, is a PCR efficiency of 100%. And R squared, so the, the perfection of your data points for your standards to make this curve, you want that as close to 1 as possible, but it needs to be greater than or equal to 0.98. And then a slope of exactly 100% PCR efficiency is minus 3.2. So if we change this threshold, we raise it, we lower it, the PCR efficiencies change. Now there is a point in here. I'm going to switch the scales from logarithmic to linear. and. The data are exactly the same, but it's just a different way to visualize. There it is. PCR efficiency of 100%, slope of minus 3.32. That means that the likelihood that you're going to get an accurate quantification for your unknowns is better than if your PCR efficiency is off. It's okay for your PCR efficiency between, to be between 90% and 110%. So you can, you can export all of the raw data by going up to the Export tab, Export in Excel, and I'm just going to export it to the desktop. And you're going to get a set of files, most of which do not give data that are useful to you. Um, however, the quantification plate view results and the quantification summary are both very helpful. So quantification plate view results. So we told the software that we wanted 5 times 10 to the 5 starting copies um, in wells A1 through 3. And so that's what it says, 4, 3, 2, 1, down to 5 copies per reaction. The starting copy number of our unknowns was automatically calculated from where those data points fell on the standard curve related to the standards themselves. And so you can tell by looking at the numbers that the unknowns in this case were just a different dilution series of the plasmid that I used for my standard control. Another data sheet that you get is the quantification summary. And this one is nice for looking at things like um, what your average CT is. Um, so it's easy to calculate 
that number. It's also easy to tell whether or not uh, these, the CT reps are within 0.3 of one another. And this is an easy way to export data for a report. This software also has an ability to generate report. I like to use the notes section here. Um, to get the notes to pop up, you have to not only click the box, but then you have to actually click the word notes also for the notes to appear. Um, but I like to have right on the front page information such as the PCR efficiency was 100%, the R squared is 0 0.995, etc. You can say update report and that information appears in that front page. So this is the report that's generated, where it's saved, what the data is named. If you scroll down, the protocol, the plate setup, here are the curves themselves, the standard curve, including the PCR efficiency, the R squared, the slope. And then there's this data table that shows all of the raw data um, that you saw in the Excel file. So uh, for each well, what the sample was, what the CT was, the average CT, standard deviation, so that's nice, what the starting quantity was for a standard or the calculated starting quantity for an unknown, and also starting quantity means and standard deviations. Down at the bottom is a chart that shows whether or not you have PCR efficiencies that fall within the required 0.98 uh, for R squared or the PCR efficiency between 90 and 110. It gives you a report on whether or not your validity requirements are accurate. So this was a quick overview of real-time PCR with a focus on equine parvovirus specifically. I'm again Lexa Scuppum and I'm available for any questions, comments, PCR development concerns, troubleshooting concerns. Um, I love this game and so I'm happy to help. Thanks.